The Lord's Day is the highlight of our week, and for good reason. Our children are now dismissed for children's church and our children's choir. And I invite the rest of you to turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 20. As we come to the highlight of the day, that is the highlight of our week, the ministry of the Word. Revelation chapter 20. Eighty-three years ago, on October 30th, 1938, a CBS program aired on national radio based on H.G. Wells' science fiction thriller, The War of the Worlds. And of course, the broadcasters informed listeners at that time that the program was a dramatization. It was fiction. But as the program continued, uh, listeners who had either not heard the announcement at the beginning or who believed that the announcement was unrelated to what they were now hearing on the radio, panic spread across the whole country. Actors simulated news reports of aliens landing in a town named Grover's Mill, New Jersey. And a fifth of Americans actually believed that an army from Mars had invaded the United States. Sounds unusual and entirely bizarre. But many of you remember learning about that in maybe your history classes or perhaps literature classes or perhaps even both. But the result was mass hysteria. Communication systems were quickly overwhelmed and overloaded. Traffic clogged up across the country as people tried to flee. They didn't know where to go. They were just going to go somewhere. So highways, road systems were shut down. People ran out into the streets or hid in fear. And that being the case, if 20% of Americans responded that way to an otherwise entirely bizarre and obviously bizarre fictional radio program that the media even stated at the beginning was fictional, how do you think the world will respond when the media reports on something that has some truth and the threat of which is real but exaggerated? We don't have to answer that question, obviously, theoretically. But the CBS program touched a nerve in American life. People were already anxious, and they feared. And between those two things is a perfect recipe for overreaction, like a dog in a corner that snaps at an innocent child who reaches out his hand to pet it. Seventy-five years after War of the Worlds was broadcast, USA Today wrote that America was already on edge due to years of economic depression and the winds of war swirling in Europe. But imagine, if you will, instead, how the world will react at a time when the human imagination cannot possibly exaggerate reality to report on it. But in fact, because the devastation is so extensive and unbelievable and global and so conclusively absolute that any report at all by necessity actually under-reports reality. might even be the only time ever that the media will attempt to undersell reality, but it will have to in collusion with the Antichrist in order to convince the world that it might make its last stand against God. When Christ's glorious returns to defeat his enemies and establish his perfectly righteous throne on earth for a thousand year reign, otherwise the world will likely be unconvinced that it would be successful. So undoubtedly, whatever is left of the media by the time 
at the end of the tribulation, they will try to undersell reality to deceive the world for this last stand. And you know that that is exactly where we are in Revelation chapter 20. Presently, we now live in what the Scriptures teach is the age of the church. The time after Christ's first advent on earth, His resurrection and His ascent to the throne in heaven, in which He rules over our hearts. He sits on the heavenly throne with His Father and He rules over our hearts. And this time will continue indefinitely until the Lord's imminent return. It began in Acts chapter 2 with the day of Pentecost, and we are now New Testament believers, and the church age will continue until, well, throughout this entire age, expecting and awaiting the Lord's imminent return. But before that happens, the Lord will bring cataclysmic judgment on earth. Before He comes in His second advent, He'll bring cataclysmic judgment on earth in order to reveal to men the wickedness of sin and to bring just judgment, but while also extending at the same time in judgment, eternal life for those who would repent and believe. For those who would repent and believe in the Lord who offers forgiveness of sins and thereby His imputed righteousness. The church will have been raptured immediately prior to this. The church age does not extend into this time of judgment, but it will end immediately prior to it according to passages like 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We call that the rapture, which means that we'll be snatched away, we'll be taken up into heaven in order to be spared from this time of judgment. And then this time, this seven-year period that we call the tribulation will commence. And it is during that time that the power of God will be known undeniably throughout the entire earth. Nobody will bring the power of God to question. Nobody will bring the existence of God to question. They won't be able to. There will no longer be any denial of His existence. No one will even deny the reality that He is the Almighty One. The Alpha and Omega. The first and the last. They will not even question that He is holy and righteous. But they will only hate that he is holy and righteous. With the exception of a few who are saved during that time. Only they will be severely persecuted and most will be martyred for their faith in the eternal king. They who demand submission will refuse to submit. They will demand submission to the Antichrist who presumably promises to satisfy every lustful indulgence that can be provided in this life when in reality He has nothing but death and captivity to offer to them. And so they'll demand submission to this King of death while they refuse to submit to the true Christ who definitively promises to satisfy every need while offering eternal life and liberty and freedom from the power of sin. They who demand justice will refuse justice. They will demand injustice to justify the martyrdom of the only ones left who act justly because they have been made new in Christ while refusing the true justice of the King of Kings that brings perfect peace and hope. And after seven years of this, Seven years of defying reality and angrily rebelling against the nature of God. Seven years of God's righteous and perfect and holy wrath. Seven years of chaos, rebellion, 
injustice, persecution of the righteous. And as I said, seven years of wrath being poured out so that men will turn away from their sin and to Christ. Those who refuse to do so will determine to harden their hearts so that they will instead gather to gl- together in a massive global army in the valley of Megiddo to take their stand. Upon reading this account, it seems pretty unbelievable. But in reality, if we understand the hearts of men, it is not so unbelievable. Upon hearing these things, it seems pretty inconceivable. But even if we observe the world around us, it is not so inconceivable. Even presently, we are beginning to doubt that justice will prevail. But rather, the media enterprise and the propaganda ministry will overthrow courts. And dissuade them from ruling righteously and instead to rule according to whatever system and worldview they want to promote. So we begin to doubt that justice will prevail, and when it does prevail, it almost surprises us, and it brings relief to us at the same time. There is still some preservation of justice, and yet we see many of those same ones who also demand that justice prevail, decry that it has prevailed, and even violently protest that it has prevailed, let alone protest without violence that has prevailed. And as we observe the adoption of relative truth, so truth can no longer be a fixed and authoritative and transcendent reality, but rather is entirely malleable according to whatever wind of the consensus, so that 2 plus 2 equals 5. It is not inconceivable to see how the world will believe that it can stand in collective consensus and defy The one who is truth. So again, if you understand the heart of man, it is really not at all difficult to see how they will act so delusionally because they are under a delusion. It is not so difficult to see how in Christ's second advent, history will repeat itself and mankind will attempt to do the very same thing that they did in Christ's first advent. And in a week's time, go from celebrating the arrival of the Messiah because they project that He will provide to them all the fleshly indulgence that they had expected the Messiah would bring in His first advent Killing the Messiah, persecuting him and scoffing him and killing him only a week later because they failed to understand the Old Testament prophecies and their hearts were hardened against the truth. History will repeat itself. Despite the fact that the Lord had made it manifest and so obvious that he was the anointed one sent from the Father. Despite the powerfully persuasive nature of the signs that he performed, essentially driving out sickness and illness and all the rest from the land. Despite even being able to raise the dead, unquestionably so, so that even Jesus' worst critics couldn't deny the reality that his miracles were authentic. They could only question the source. But they would still kill him. Completely irrational, completely delusional, but once again, mankind will act so delusionally and irrationally because they are under a delusion, they are slaves to sin, their hearts are shackled with a spiritual bondage, having been arrested by all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, 1 John 2.16 says. And not only that, 
But they are delusional because they have fallen under the deluding influence. Because instead of submitting themselves to the God of truth, they have submitted themselves to the father of lies, who was, as you know, a murderer from the beginning. And so when he speaks, he speaks from his own nature, since there is no truth at all in him, John 8, 44 says. So a time will come. It's necessary. If there is any righteousness, if there is any holiness, if there is any justice, in other words, if there is any God, it is necessary that a time will come when one day there has to be a verdict. And a time will come. And it should be obvious to all of us that it must come, and all men do know that it must come because all men know the existence of God. Since He Himself has revealed Himself in creation and has also written Himself on the heart of every man so that their conscience alternatively accusing or defending them. We understand that in fact there has to be a day that is coming when judgment comes, when there is a verdict that is rendered against all that is wrong in the world. A verdict that is rendered against sin. A verdict that is rendered against all those who have transgressed God's law. There must be justice. Justice is the only way to stop the violence, the sin, the corruption, the wickedness, the greed, the lust, the murderer, the theft, the lies, all of it. The Lord must return. He most absolutely must return. Beyond that, we see the volatile nature of our world around us. It seems that all of humanity is hanging by the thread of a spider dangling over a fire. I read yesterday that tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of protesters throughout all of Europe marched in cities throughout Austria, Italy, Croatia, Switzerland, Ireland, and the Netherlands due to more COVID restrictions that prevent them from shopping from grocery, for groceries, let alone enjoying Christmas festivities and life in general, holding jobs and so forth. Because of COVID restrictions, as governments continue to try to do what they have not been able to do now for two years. Two years. People are tired of it. Some are provoked to violence. They don't know what to do. They can't make sense of this world. And they have no hope such as one physician in Germany, who I also read about yesterday, who committed suicide, threw himself from the top of his hospital building when he was presented by the mayor of his city that he can either force his patients to get vaccinated against their will or lose his job. And so he determined it would be better to take his life than be presented with either of those two options. Man without hope. Senators in America, they're very ones who legislate law erupted on social media this last week because they hate when the law is upheld. It begs the question, doesn't it? How long can the world really go on like this? It's self-destructing. And quite honestly, that is an answer that we don't know the answer to. That is a question we don't know the answer to. But we know that the Lord will come. And we know that the Lord must come. And He will come quickly when He comes. 
And until then, we feel like the prophet Habakkuk, who said in Habakkuk chapter 1, crying out, How long, O Lord? The law is ignored. Justice is never upheld. For the wicked surround the righteous, and therefore justice comes out perverted. So I lay that backdrop for you because it reminds us that there is a problem of evil in the world. And there can only be one solution to the problem of evil. And this is the solution to the problem of evil in Revelation chapter 20. The righteous judge and king must return. And when he returns, he must administer righteousness and justice. And you and I don't know when that is. But you need to know that he will be an absolutely perfect and righteous judge. And that means that you need to make sure that you yourself are perfectly guiltless before a holy God. First John 3 says, in verse 4, everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness. And sin is lawlessness. And you know that He appeared in order to take away sins, and in Him there is no sin. So, verse 3 says, And everyone who has this hope fixed on Him purifies Himself, just as He is pure. All are guilty. All have sinned. All are counted lawless before a holy God who must come to judge the world. And it is only those who have their hope fixed on Him who will be declared guiltless. And with that, for those who have been made pure because they have their hope fixed on Him, look forward to His return with great anticipation And so what we read here in Revelation chapter 20 comes to us as a source of tremendous encouragement. We understand its necessity. It answers for us the so-called problem of evil. How can a good God who is holy and perfect and all-powerful and all-knowing allow evil in the world? And if you dare, you might even be willing to ask the question, but why? If Christ returns and is victorious over the deceiving serpent and rebellious and wicked people, why would he set up his righteous reign only to release Satan again after all these things in a thousand years to deceive the world again? He set up his throne. He was victorious. He drove out wickedness from the world. So why would he let it occur all over again? You dare to ask the question. But both those questions are in fact answered for us in Revelation chapter 20. But you'll only like the answer if you love the character of God. And if you love the character of God, you will rejoice to see his character glorified. Manifest in brilliant display before all the world. It becomes very obvious that even God's patience and mercy toward men will not change the hearts of men. That's the summation that comes with this verdict. All throughout history, we don't know how long, but since the fall of man, God has been ever so patient with all mankind, and even then, He gives them a final seven years in His wrath to repent. And so, the nature that He finally comes and concludes His patience. Because it is now the time for judgment. 
makes it obvious to us that it is not for a lack of patience and mercy towards men that they have not repented. And it is not for even his wrath and judgment that they do not change their hearts. But also, once Christ returns and establishes his throne, it becomes likewise evident in verses 7 to 10 that even a perfect kingdom will not change the hearts of men. So no, neither are God's forbearance for thousands of years will change the hearts of men. Neither will His just judgment, but still patience as He allows a final time for repentance to change the hearts of men. And even after bringing His judgment, when the sword comes out of the mouth of our risen Christ, destroying His enemies, and He sets up His perfect kingdom, and all is well, it still will not change the hearts of men. Lawlessness must be dealt with in court. And sin must be dealt with justice. And by the way, the message of this text proves to be an incalculable consolation to all those believers throughout the ages who have endured otherwise unbearable uncertainty and persecution. And uncertainty and persecution that we have not yet known. And even as we observe the world around us, it proves to be an incalculable consolation to us as well because it will be a day in which all things are made new. And so we read in verse 1 to remind you where we left off two weeks ago. I saw an angel coming down from heaven holding the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand and he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan and bound him for a thousand years. And he threw him into the abyss and shut it and sealed it over him so that he would not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were completed. And after these things, he must be released for a short time. Even patience and mercy will not change the hearts of men. Even being slow to anger not change the hearts of men. And even God's just judgment will not change the hearts of men. And so that time of patience and mercy has now come to a conclusion. He casts Satan into hell. Locks him away. And then in verse 4 we read, Then I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was given to them, and I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God. And those who had not worshipped the beast or his image had not received the mark on their forehead and on their hand. And they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power. But they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. This is the inauguration, of course, of something that we have called the millennial kingdom. When the whole world is governed by a theocracy and so its kingdom will be defined according to the same nature of God himself. He will directly rule, and it will be defined by peace and harmony and righteousness, and his saints will rule and reign with him as his vice regents on the earth. And even though the subjects of his kingdom will not all be perfect, as we'll soon see, the glorified saints that rule with him will be. These are the same ones who make up the ranks of the Lord's army when he returns. It includes... The Old Testament saints, Daniel chapter 7 verse 27 says that then the sovereignty, the dominion, and the greatness of all the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be given to the people of the saints of the highest one. 
His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all the dominions will serve and obey him. And Jesus also promised his disciples in Matthew chapter 19, verse 28, that in the regeneration, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, speaking of this same event of the second advent, you also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So Old Testament saints will reign with Christ and there will be a restoration of Israel. And there will also be believers from the church age, New Testament believers, who will likewise reign with Him. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 2, Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? Speaking, of course, in that context of the church. And again, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12, that if we endure and so thereby proving to be His disciples, we will also reign with Him. And similarly, in Revelation chapter 2, verse 26, the Lord says to the church in Thyatira, and by implication, all New Testament believers as well, and all churches as well, because you remember we said that these were actual historical churches throughout Asia Minor, but yet at the same time, their issues are representative of all issues that have existed in all churches. And so the message to them is a message to us He who overcomes then, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne, as I also overcome and sat down with my father on his throne. Now, having said that, there are some who say, well, yes, but that's a spiritual reign. It's a spiritual reign, and the reign that we're talking about in Revelation chapter 4, or chapter 20, verses 4 through 6, is a spiritual kingdom. And so these individuals, these saints, will rule from heaven over hearts as Christ sat down with his Father on his throne. And they say that to justify that there is no physical millennial kingdom that Christ will rule over. But rather, we are in the spiritual millennium. That's why it's called amillennialism. There is no future millennium. We are in the millennium now. It's spiritual, not an actual physical kingdom. And this is all that there is, which is really disappointing. Chapter 5, Revelation chapter 5, verse 10 says explicitly and thankfully, you have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. So this isn't the kingdom. The kingdom isn't now. The kingdom is yet to be in the future, and it'll be a wonderful and perfect kingdom. And so that's pretty straightforward, but you also have this third group that reigns with Christ mentioned here in verse 4 as well. These are the tribulation saints who were beheaded. Telekidzo is the word. That's the standard form of capital punishment in Rome. The root of the word means axe. The original way of beheading an individual, inflicting capital punishment, the axe, of course, eventually was replaced with the sword. And the reason that they received such capital punishment is explained as well, and it is because, simply, they refused to worship the beast, pay homage to the beast, and take his image of loyalty to the beast. They refused to give allegiance to the beast or take his mark. And they were willing to give up their lives for it. Because they did not belong to the beast, they belonged to God. You want to talk about a tyrannical government. This is very important. They came to life. They came to life. That single statement completely unravels any idea that this millennial kingdom should only be understood in a spiritual sense as well. There are some who likewise try to say that this isn't talking about physical life, it's just talking about regeneration, but that's a real problem. Because what's the order here? They're beheaded and then they experience regeneration. In other words, they have to die to experience regeneration. They experience regeneration after death. 
That is essentially what the doctrine of purgatory says. That regeneration occurs after death, at some undefined time, after you've paid some undefined penalty. And that isn't found anywhere in Scripture. And not only that, but there are two particular words here, both resurrection and life, that make it impossible to think of this as merely a spiritual resurrection. 41 out of 42 times in the New Testament, the word resurrection speaks of a physical resurrection. And that makes it really difficult to understand it any differently here unless it can't be understood here in the same way that it is used by the far majority in the New Testament. But rather, to understand the word resurrection consistently with physical resurrection is what makes most sense. And not only that, but life obviously means life in verse 5 to speak of those who do not come to life until the second resurrection. And in fact, that's not even disputed. There isn't anyone who believes that verse 5 is talking about only a spiritual resurrection because if they experience a spiritual resurrection, then why, in fact, are they judged? So verse 5, life must necessarily refer to physical life. They are still dead, and they have to be raised to spiritual life for a particular purpose. And obviously, these two resurrections that are being talked about in verses 4 and 5 are set in contrast with one another. It's a tale of two resurrections. One resurrection brings back the dead who belong to Christ to reign in the millennium, and the other resurrection brings back the rest of the dead, those who were not brought back to life to reign in the millennium. And why wouldn't they be brought back to life at the beginning of the millennium? Well, obviously because of what is implied in verse 6. They are not blessed. And they are not holy. And so they will only be resurrected then for judgment. Verse 14 calls the second death a lake of fire. And all those who experience the first resurrection will escape that because they have been saved through our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and 5 says, Having now been justified by His blood, and now being saved from the wrath of God through Him. Romans 5, 9. So God's people will reign over His kingdom. An actual kingdom on earth. But keep in mind that those believers who survive the tribulation, they're alive. They obviously don't need to be resurrected into life, and they too will reign and they are there when Christ returns and establishes his throne. And they are there when he slaughters his enemies with the sword from his mouth in Revelation chapter 19. And they enter into the kingdom again alive. And therefore, they do not have glorified bodies as of yet. The curse will be lifted from the earth, Isaiah tells us. And it will be a time full of righteousness and peace. Joel tells us that food will be plentiful, never will there be any famine, and it'll be an age marked by long life. In fact, you know, as Isaiah 65 verse 20 tells us, that it'll be said that if a man dies when he is 100, he'll be considered to be a young man. His life will have been considered to be cut short. But these believers who experience the tribulation and survive, and the suffering of the tribulation and they survive, and the persecution of the tribulation and survive, they will enter into the millennial kingdom without glorified bodies, and so they will still pass along their sin nature to their children. And many of them will be saved, their children. All those will be saved entering into the millennium. And most of their children will likewise be saved in the millennium, but they need to be saved. And because they are now being born in the millennium from those who still have a sin nature, there will be some who do not repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Verses 7 to 10 makes that obvious. In fact, this will be a 
population of the earth, a repopulation of the earth at a rate that the world has never experienced. Because once again, men will live to old age and a hundred will be considered to be young. There will be nothing to inhibit, no disease, no destruction, no war. There will be no famine, no disease, nothing to cut life short. And so the population of the earth will flourish. And so though many will believe verses 7 to 10 in fact, reminds us that there will be many that will not believe. And verse, verses 4 to 6 reminds us that God is perfect in His patience to bring about His perfect goodwill and kingdom plan. But verses 7 to 10 reminds us that even a perfect environment will not change the hearts of men. Even a perfect environment will not take away sins. So verse 7 says, because of that, when the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for the war. The number of them is like the sand of the seashore. And they came up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city, and fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are also. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. You think that there are people out there who hate seeing justice prevail now? Imagine what a thousand years of imprisonment and fiery torment will do to Satan. At the end of the millennium, Satan will be released and he'll be like a hornet's nest shaken in a bottle. Kind of mixing metaphors there a little bit. You can't put a hornet's nest in a bottle, but you get the idea. He'll be furious and he will act furiously. But once again, it's evident that the millennial kingdom can only refer to an actual thousand-year reign on earth, not a spiritual kingdom, and not just a long period of time. The text doesn't allow for that interpretation if it's understood in its plain sense in verses 7 to 10 because Satan is imprisoned. And if we're in the millennial kingdom now, then how exactly is Satan imprisoned? There are some who say that he is in prison, but in prison doesn't mean in prison. It just means restrained. He's not imprisoned, he's restrained. He's only imprisoned in the sense that he can't thwart the progress of the gospel. And while that's true, there is a sense in which he cannot thwart the progress of the gospel. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16 that he'll build his church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. So that's true, but if that's all Revelation means when Revelation 20 verse 7 says that he is released from his prison then the book severely overplays the nature of his imprisonment. It's misleading. Remember, verses 2 to 3 says that he was bound, he was shut, and he was sealed in the abyss for a thousand years. And then verse 7 confirms again he is imprisoned. It's pretty forcible. And the particular word for abyss, in fact, implies there's no passing in and out of there. In fact, never in the New Testament when this word abyss is used does it indicate that there is any passing in and out of the abyss. You remember Luke chapter 8 when Jesus cast the demons out of the demoniac and they beg him not to send them into the abyss, but instead beg him to send them into the swine so that they might continue to do their destructive work. And you also remember Revelation chapter 9, when finally, for the first time, those demons that have been bound up since the days of Noah are released from the abyss. They can't simply pass in and out of there, presumably at their will. They had to have been released. And so Satan, likewise, is cast into the abyss, and the language doesn't allow for partial restraint. He is totally restrained. He is imprisoned. But now, at the end of the millennial kingdom, he is released. And what does he do then? 
He is released to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth. That is to say, over the entire earth. He goes out over the whole world and deceives mankind from all over the world. He finds loyal slaves in every nation of the earth. Which here are referred to as Gog and Magog. The reference to Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 2, to speak of the enemies of Christ, enemies of the Messiah. And he gathers them together for the war. The number of them is like the sand on the seashore. And they came up upon the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city and fire came down from heaven and devoured them. We said that the population of the earth will boom at an unbelievable rate during this time because there is nothing to restrain it. Blessing is everywhere. But Satan will still come and deceive so many. Can you imagine? So imagine surviving the tribulation. Seeing all that judgment of God. Seeing his victory over what's left of the nations. And then seeing history repeat itself yet again when Satan comes and deceives the world again. And these are your offspring, your children, that he comes to deceive. As many of them like the sand of the seashore. It's the same hyperbole that is used to describe the descendants of Abraham, remember? And it begs the question, to get back where we started, why? Why? Why does God release Satan at the most blessed place in history? Why does it bring it to an end? Why cannot Christ continue to rule over this kingdom? Why does he allow men to be deceived one final time? And there will be some who read this, you can be sure, who will then blame God. They will undoubtedly blame God for this. After all, he is the one who releases Satan. Who is otherwise perfectly bound. But by these things he will prove that he is not the problem of evil or the cause of these things. He is the law-abiding ruler. He is the righteous and holy one. And any problem rests only with Satan and the incurable, rebellious nature of men's hearts. Everything is perfect. Everything is perfect. But men's hearts still rebel. God is not the problem. Man is. And because of that, God will allow Satan to sow discontentment in perfection. And because what is right is wrong and what is wrong is right to them, they will demand a new king for a ruler they will call justice unjust. It will be a time of an absolute defiance of reality. It will be reversion to Romans 1, 18-32. It will be absolutely irrational and pretty unbelievably, actually, if not that we keep seeing relatively faint images of these things in the world today, if you have eyes to see them. And that's why, in case you were absolutely perplexed by the last line of verse 3, he must be released for a time, that he is released for a time. It is a divine necessity in the wisdom and counsel of God. And the world will see that even after a thousand years of Satan's imprisonment and Christ's righteous reign, men's hearts are still so perverse that they are primed and ready to believe Satan's lies. The problem of evil has not gone away, and so God must deal with it completely and conclusively. And verse 10, then the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone 
where the beast and the false prophet are also. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. That is poignant and decisive. The wages of sin, here is the point, will be paid for forever and ever. Their punishment as eternal as God himself is. Isaiah chapter 11 verse 9 says, They will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of Yahweh as the waters cover the sea. God will prove himself just and he will manifest his perfect wisdom and his righteousness at the end of this age. And what we'll see next week in the judgment he brings over all mankind. Let's close in prayer. Precious Father, we do see the excellencies of your wisdom And yet your thoughts, we know, are not our thoughts. Your ways are not our ways. We cannot comprehend all that you know, nor can we even comprehend the extent of your perfection. And we trust in you, Lord, in your perfect wisdom to bring your righteousness and your justice in your perfect timing. And as we see the world collapse in catastrophe all around us, Lord, we do pray that you would quickly come. We shout Maranatha. And at the same time, we also shout and pray that men will come to know you quickly because the time is near so that they can be accredited with the righteousness of God and be declared just in your sight and not incur the wages of sin, but be blessed because they participate in the first resurrection with us. We ask all these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will do all these things, King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen.